Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes to settle in. And uh, can I just welcome you all to the 14th meeting of the Social Security Committee for 2017. Can remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones as it does interfere with the recording system. I know that some people might be feeling a wee bit delicate this morning, so I'll do my best. I'm not looking at anyone or picking anyone in particular. Uh, apologies have been received from Mark Griffin and Richard Lennon is in attendance as a substitute. Thank you, Richard. Our first item today is continued consideration of the Child Poverty Bill at Stage 2. Last week's meeting we concluded by agreeing Amendment 43 and we will continue from that point this morning. Uh, can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and the company officials to the meeting and we now move on to Stage 2 proceedings. Can I first of all call Amendment 34 in the name of Polly McNeil, grouped with Amendments 44, 45 and 46. Polly McNeil to move Amendment 34 and speak to all other amendments in the group. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, in moving Amendment 34, uh, Amendment 34 describes the effects of those measures towards persons who have one or more protected characteristics in terms of the Quality Act 2010. <coughs> me. Um, this relates to a previous amendment moved by Jackie Bailey. I heard what the Minister had to say on that and I, I presume that the Minister will um, ask me the same as she asked of Jackie Bailey, in which case I would be happy um, to uh, withdraw that if the committee are so inclined, but for purposes of the procedure I have to move Amendment 34. Uh, amendment 44 is to include in the annual report progress towards meeting child poverty targets in respect of children living in households that include a person with a long-term illness or disability. Again, it relates to some of the issues which I have raised previously in the debate about uh, making sure that there is special mention of um, progress towards those with a, a disability. Uh, amendment 45 um, is in section 8 to describe measures of the, the progress for ministers to describe progress towards meeting the child poverty targets um, for those with single parent households it relates to a previous amendment already moved. And finally, amendment 46. Amendment 46, um, it, it, it occurred to me that in um, if ministers, uh, when preparing the, the plan for reducing child poverty, um, may want to rectify um, that plan, and it would make sense to perhaps set out um, what they intend to do if, the, if that arose, uh, to rectify um, any measures to uh, get back on track um, for uh, reducing child poverty targets. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Morning, Convener. Hope you're all feeling bright and breezy. Uh, convener, Amendments uh, 34, 44 and 45 uh, set out that annual progress reports uh, must describe the effect of the, the measures being taken for uh, particular uh, groups. Um, on Amendment 34, uh, which relates to protected characteristics, uh, Ms McNeill's uh, correct. I will refer committee to the points uh, that I made during last week's committee session uh, in relation to Ms Bailey's amendments. Uh, the reference to persons having protected characteristics is worded in a problematic way because every person has more than one protected characteristic, age and gender at least. Uh, and as Ms McNeill highlighted, Ms Bailey uh, withdrew her amendment. Uh, for that reason as uh, if effectively referring to everyone uh, as opposed to the in in intent which was to have a, a, a focus on people with protected characteristics. Um, I also have uh, similar concerns in relation to Amendment uh, 44, principally around uh, drafting and uh, definitions. Uh, Amendment 44, as we've heard, refers to children living in a household that includes uh, a person who has a long-term illness uh, or disability. And as members of the Social Security Committee will be aware from other pieces of work, it is important that we use the right language and are absolutely clear uh, about the parameters of the groups we are we're trying to reach. So while I think that Ms McNeill is uh, absolutely uh, right and correct to highlight the specific issues facing those with long-term disability, I would ask her that, like Amendment 34, 
24 uh, that she withdraw the amendment with a view to discussing further uh, with myself and officials over the summer uh, as the meaning of some of the terms in that amendment are just not clear and for example what would constitute a long-term illness or uh, disability. In terms of Amendment 45, which refers to measures taken in relation to single parents, again, I agree that this is a very important issue and I'm very supportive of the principle. Uh, I do note that the drafting differs slightly from Amendment 38, which also refers to single parent households and was voted through last week in reference to delivery plans. So I reserve the right to look uh, at this further at the drafting of this amendment in advance of Stage 3, although I'm very content to support Amendment 45 uh, today. Amendment 46 would require the Scottish Ministers to set out in a progress report what they propose to do in the event that sufficient progress towards the targets has not been made. Uh, again, I'm supportive of this idea. The progress reports uh, will be a key tool that will allow us to assess how Ministers are doing uh, and to evaluate Ministers' uh, policies and programmes on the basis of the evidence. Uh, and while I'm uh, content to support this amendment in principle, I would stress that some of the interventions Ministers take to meet the targets are long-term ones uh, and we will not see immediate results. Uh, in addition, um, I may reflect on the drafting of this amendment for Stage 3, but uh, this will not uh, affect uh, my acceptance of the policy intention uh, behind this amendment today. So, Convener, uh, I support amendments 45 and 46 uh, and uh, oppose amendments 34 and 44 uh, only for the issues I've outlined around drafting and definitions. Thank you very much. Any other members want to come in? Okay. Uh, Polly Meany, do you want to wind up or press withdraw? And, uh, thank you, Meany. Um, just to thank the Minister for her response. And in view of that, I would seek withdrawal of Amendment 34. Uh, and I will not be seeking to press Amendment 44, but I will press on 45 and 46 and welcome the Minister's support for those amendments. Is that an agreement with the Committee that the Amendment 34 be withdrawn? Thank you. And Amendment 44, you're not pressing, pressing. Okay, thank you very much. Amendment 45, Amendment Polly McNeil, move or not move? Move. Is that agreed? Amendment 45, okay, that's agreed. Yep, we've agreed Amendment 45, that's fine, thank you. Call Amendment 46, Amendment Polly McNeil already is baited with Amendment 34. Polly McNeil, move or not move? Move. Is that agreed? Amendment 46 be agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 47 in the name of Paula McNeill. Already debated with Amendment 15. Paula McNeill, move or not move? 47. Move. Then the question is Amendment 47 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Call Amendment 48 in the name of Ben McPherson, which is already debated with Amendment 43. Ben McPherson to move or not move? Move. Questions Amendment 40, 48, sorry I said 47, apologies, be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yep. Okay. Questions at section 8 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 23, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 9. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. I'm happy to formally move this consequential amendment. Thank you. Questions at Amendment 23 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 24 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 9. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Again, happy to formally move consequential amendments 24 Thank you. and 25. Question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 25 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 9. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. It moved. Question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 49 in the name of Alison Johnson, a group of its own. Alison Johnson, to move and speak to Amendment 49. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the Stage 1 report made a recommendation, unanimously supported by this committee, that because the policy actions required by this bill will have resource implications, budget plans should make direct links with child poverty delivery plans and progress reports. And Amendment 49 was drafted to give effect to the intention behind that recommendation. And I'm very pleased to see that the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland are recommending members to support it. 
We know from past experience, and, and it's obvious that budget decisions can have a big impact on child poverty. Um, I, I think it's recognised that some of the tax and spending decisions of new labour in the 2000s led to historically and internationally unprecedented falls in child poverty. And what this amendment does is ask the Scottish Government to explain how the annual Scottish budgets will impact upon progress made towards the Bill's target. And I'd like to draw the attention of the committee um, to the evidence we've heard previously on the issue of how the child poverty targets and the budget process are linked. And Jim McCormack, Dr Jim McCormack told us on the 27th of March that the more we can drive resource allocation decisions that are based on evidence from what has and hasn't worked, the more the delivery plan becomes a living, breathing, practical and useful plan rather than something that sits to the side of what government is doing. And I would support being explicit about the government having to make the link with its annual budget process in particular. And several other witnesses, including Naomi Eisenstadt, also told us about the importance of the budget process for the child poverty targets and the need for a link between the two. And I would suggest that the way this can be achieved is to require the Scottish Government to produce projections of how its tax and spending plans will impact on child poverty. This is a way of entrenching the aim of reducing child poverty against any future government's intentions to reduce efforts to meet the targets. Any such government intending to reduce their budgetary commitments would certainly have to think twice about that if the projections showed uh, you know, a projected slowdown in progress towards meeting the targets or indeed a projected increase. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Alison Johnson. Adam Tomkins, you wanted to come in on this particular um, Yeah, thank you. Um, convener, as well as serving on this committee, I'm also the deputy convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee. And I'm um, not, absolutely not speaking on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee, but I think that the um, committee here this morning should be aware of the fact that um, there has been a budget process review group which I think is about to report imminently. Its interim report was published, I think, three months ago. Um, and um, uh, I, I obviously can't say anything about what will be in the report of the budget process review, review group, but I just wonder whether um, the wording of this amendment will be compatible with what the budget process review group recommends in terms of what I think are likely to be quite significant changes to budget process. So I, I just wonder, I have a completely open mind about this, Convener, but I just wonder whether it would be better to revisit this issue at stage three, once we've all had the opportunity to read and digest the, um, the recommendations of the budget process review group, and indeed um, uh, report back, if we want to, to the Finance Committee about our views as a Social Security Committee on the budget process review group's recommendations. So I, I, I'm sorry to throw that slight like spanner in the works, but it might just be uh, that this is better um, examined at stage three than at stage two, given what is about to happen in terms of the publication of recommendations about budget process. Thank you, Mr Thompson, for that update. Ben McPherson, did you want to come in? Okay. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I start by saying I do very much appreciate the rationale and the, the purpose of the intent uh, behind this amendment. Uh, members um, want to understand the effect uh, and impact of government spending uh, on making progress towards the targets, uh, and uh, rightly so. Uh, however, I do want to begin by setting out what is already uh, in place to deliver the spirit of that amendment uh, in relation to the, the, the Scottish budget uh, process, and then I'll pick up some of the, the issues that were raised with, uh, by Mr. Mr Tompkins. The equality budget statement published alongside the draft budget every year uh, contains an assessment of the impacts of spending choices on low-income households with children. Uh, we're also, as members will be aware, considering uh, how we expand this uh, because the social economic duty, uh, which I'm going to be consulting on uh, shortly, will enable us to take uh, important steps forward. In addition, uh, we have equality impact assessments. Uh, they are already a statutory requirement for new policies and proposals, and they include a focus on age. Uh, so issues affecting children should be uh, brought out uh, within those. Uh, and as many members, I'm sure, will be aware, we're also required to conduct child rights and wellbeing impact assessments on relevant matters to uh, setting out whether our policies, measures, uh, legislation, whether they protect and promote uh, the wellbeing of children and young people. So. Uh, 
Um, I wanted to highlight that because there are existing assessments and frameworks already in place around the draft budget, uh, and in my view, um, you know, the, the child poverty issues are already uh, reflected uh, in the issues that I've uh, highlighted in a proportionate and sensible way. Um, however, as others have done, uh, we've heard from Mr Tompkins, I would also like to point members to the ongoing work of the Parliamentary Budget Review Group. The Budget Review Group is in the process of a fundamental review of the Scottish Parliament's budget process uh, following the devolution of further powers in the Scotland Act 2012 and the Scotland Act 2016. And I understand, uh, like others, that the group is due uh, in the very, very near future to report its findings imminently, uh, both to ministers uh, and, importantly, to the Finance Committee. So I would uh, therefore respectfully uh, suggest that it would be preemptive to introduce legislative requirements uh, relating to the budget process at this stage uh, before we have seen the, the outcome of a very detailed uh, piece of work. The Budget Review Group was set up to uh, bring forward proposals for a revised budget process for consideration, uh, as I said, by the Finance Committee and Scottish Government Ministers. Um, as already highlighted, an interim report uh, was published for consultation uh, in March. Obviously, um, as part of the process, uh, there was an opportunity uh, for um, people to be making suggested changes to the bud budget process as a whole there. Um, and you know, my contention would be you know, that would be you know, preferable um, as opposed to amendments on, on this bill. So, Convener, um, at this time, uh, I think it would be unhelpful for this committee to vote through amendments which affect the budget process at this time, uh, when the review group has put significant amounts of time and effort uh, into providing ministers on the Finance Committee with a very detailed and thorough review based on evidence. Uh, and I would hope uh, that committee members uh, would uh, be supportive uh, in the recommendation uh, that we do not pass this amendment today uh, before giving due consideration uh, to that report. So, uh, convener, I recommend that members uh, oppose Amendment 49. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I think it's an important point that has been raised. Uh, I think it's important we do look at budget proofing all of the issues that go forward in legislation in the Parliament. And I think the points that have been raised by Mr Tompkins and obviously Cabinet Secretary are, are, are uh, very important points at the moment. But uh, do you want to wind up, Alison Johnson, Alice Alison Johnson? Yeah, and sir, the press sir, uh, uh, um, Thank you, Convener. Um, I, uh, I would like to address some of the points made by colleagues. Um, I think this amendment... Um, it doesn't require the Scottish Government to make projections about impacts on child poverty that are any way, in any way experimental or require significant additional resourcing or capacity. Um, I think it's important that this Parliament strives always to improve the quality and availability of data that we have on poverty um, available to the Government to inform policy making. But I think it's really important that we do all that we can to project the impact of tax and spending proposals on poverty. Um, I think that's quite a common exercise. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, for example, regularly produces such projections. Now, um, Adam Tompkins said, you're speaking about the, the budget review process, and you've said that you can't say anything about what will be in the review. So I am here today, at stage two of this bill, um, with none of this information available to me. And I think it's really important that we make the link between this bill and the budget process. Um, colleagues suggest that a similar aim could be achieved through a replacement for equality budget statements, which will be proposed by the Budget Process Review Group tomorrow. So, it, it, you know, it may be the case, but it may not. You know, where, where we're sitting today, we don't know. I, I personally am perfectly willing to look at what's proposed and see if that would meet the intentions of the amendment. But until I see detailed proposals, I do wish to press ahead with the amendment. If we're going to put back into law income targets for child poverty reduction and legally require that the Scottish Government report on how it's striving to meet them, then it's really no stretch at all to say that there should be a requirement for the Government to explain how its budget, which will inevitably have an effect on incomes, will impact progress towards these targets. And of course, we have stage three to make any adjustments that may or may not be required. I'd like to move my, my, the amendment. Press amendment. Thank okay. you. Alison Johnson. The question is that uh, Amendment 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a vote. Okay. All those in favour of Amendment 49, please show. All those against?
any abstentions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Total votes four, three. Total votes against four. And total abstentions two. The amendment has not been passed. Thank you. Uh, call amendment uh, 50, in the name of Richard Leonard, uh, grouped with amendments 51, 52 and 54. Richard Leonard to move the amendment and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, yes, I'd like to move uh, amendments 50, 51, 52 um, and 54. Um, the intention of these amendments is to ensure that the widest possible engagement with community planning partners uh, is uh, included. Uh, when developing uh, local child poverty action reports. Um, it's clear that the intent of the bill is to secure uh, as much national but also local um, uh, input into the attainment of the targets uh, set down in the bill. And so therefore local child poverty action reports are an essential part of the process. Um, the um, uh, bodies that are involved in uh, community planning partnerships are wider than, of course, simply local government and health boards. Uh, but actually, uh, I think uh, that's all the more reason why they should be included <coughs> as bodies uh, who have to make a contribution towards uh, the report. Uh, just this morning, we've got two uh, press articles, which it seems to me highlight the need for this wider rather than narrower approach. Uh, the number of children in Scotland without a permanent home has reached a six-year high, with more than 6,000 youngsters recorded as living in temporary accommodation, um, a 13 per cent rise. Um, and another report from Edinburgh University which says Scottish school leavers from poorer families are significantly more likely to be unemployed. And that's why I, I think it's absolutely essential that we include uh, bodies like Scottish Enterprise, Highlands Isles Enterprise, um, uh, further education colleges, uh, transport partnerships and so on in this process of uh, developing these uh, lo local action plans. And I note that the, um, uh, the financial memorandum that accompanies the bill uh, speaks itself uh, in paragraph 23 that the Scottish Government will work with local authorities and health boards to produce guidance on how the reporting should operate and would expect community planning partnerships to be a useful vehicle by which to coordinate this work. Uh, I also note that the, uh, the committee received evidence on this subject as well, uh, where um, the Aberdeenshire uh, Community uh, Planning Partnership uh, suggested that CPPs should be added to the face of the bill, describing the current provision as, and I quote, a missed opportunity to ensure, the, uh, to ensure reporting of the fullest possible range of actors at a local level. Uh, I therefore move this amendment. Thank you. Ben McPherson, you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, while I uh, share Richard Leonard's uh, overarching principle to uh, encourage local engagement uh, in general terms, I have concerns about these amendments uh, for, for several reasons. First of all, uh, I'm not absolutely clear uh, what the, the amendments would achieve, although I'm, I'm, I acknowledge the introductory remarks that were, were made uh, a few moments ago. But also I, I'm concerned that by doing this amendment uh, we would override, uh, we would over a wide variety of bodies uh, place uh, obligations uh, for which uh, they have no immediate role in tackling child poverty and also that they have not been uh, consulted uh, on having this duty placed on them, and, and for those reasons, uh, I'm not able to support these amendments. Okay. Any other members wish to come in? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, let me once again uh, state that I very much understand uh, why Mr uh, Leonard is uh, proposing these amendments, uh, and I absolutely understand what he is seeking uh, to achieve uh, with amendments 50, 51, 52 and 54. And it was indeed very apparent uh, in the Stage 1 discussions that uh, there was some appetite for local reporting duty to be placed uh, on community planning partnerships. Uh, and indeed, at the start of this process, for myself uh, as uh, a minister. Uh, 
would have uh, instinctively uh, have been what I would have wanted uh, to have done. Uh, but it was very clear to me in terms of the advice I had received from officials uh, that uh, we couldn't actually place uh, duties as such uh, directly on community plan and partnerships because they're not legal entities uh, in their own right and they don't actually um, employ people. But let me see in terms of the points that Mr Leonard makes about um, how could I put it, not letting organisations such as our enterprise agencies uh, and other organisations, uh, not letting them off the hook uh, and the, you know, having to uh, make a contribution uh, to endeavours, uh, particularly around employment in relation to child poverty, is absolutely crucial. Um, I do want to reassure members that I have uh, considered uh, these matters very carefully um, but I suppose what I don't agree with at the end of the day is that we should mandate additional partner organisations to prepare uh, local reports uh, in terms of, uh, as proposed by Mr Leonard's um, amendments, and essentially for, for, for three reasons. First, in terms of leadership, I do, again, agree with the spirit of the amendments that local authorities and health boards uh, will want to engage with local partners uh, in the development of their annual reports, but the duty as it stands, gives it a clear leadership role locally to health boards and to local authorities. And in my view, uh, that's absolutely right. These are the key strategic uh, players uh, and they should take on that leadership role uh, on child poverty. And that's why um, they are already central to the reference group that I've set out and uh, they have a role to develop uh, guidance. Second, on a more pragmatic level, uh, some of the bodies included in the, in the list that Mr Leonard suggests have at best a tangential role in terms of tackling uh, child poverty. I, of course, accept entirely the very obvious role of Skills Development Scotland, further education colleges, uh, enterprise agencies, but the list as proposed is extensive. It includes bodies such as Scottish Environment Protection Agency, uh, Scottish National Heritage, and I'm just not convinced that these bodies are sufficiently uh, relevant to issues of child poverty to merit uh, annual reporting. Uh, and I should also say that, as far as I'm aware, these additional bodies uh, have not been consulted on a potential duty, uh, and I would have some concerns uh, about that. Uh, our approach to duties under the Bill has to be both proportionate and relevant, uh, and that's why I think it's appropriate that we limit uh, annual reporting duties to those that have a very clear day-to-day -day role in dealing with uh, children and uh, families. Third, um, on a point of principle, the Community Empowerment Act that set up community plan and partnerships did so precisely uh, to put power in the hands of communities themselves. So community plan and partnerships are required to set out their own priorities for improvement agreed locally in a collaborative way uh, with the participation uh, of their communities. Uh, they are required to agree these priorities based on an evidence-based understanding of local needs, circumstances and opportunities. And they are required to be accountable uh, to their communities and report publicly uh, to their communities on the improvements that they have made. So, convener, it would seem to me to be contrary to the general principles of the Community Empowerment Act, which has been established specifically to place local people and communities at the heart of what we do. Uh, and if the Parliament were to turn around uh, and instruct CPPs uh, what to do, it would indeed seem uh, contrary uh, to, to those principles. I mentioned the, the reference group uh, that is developing guidance on local reporting duty. That group has met once already, has two further meetings scheduled over the summer. Uh, it's made you know, good progress thus far, and I want to reassure Mr Leonard and others that I will ask the group to consider uh, what more can be done to make sure that the guidance at a local level delivers the kind of partnership working uh, that he has uh, in mind. And I do appreciate that he was struck by the evidence heard uh, at stage one about the importance of community plan and partnerships. Uh, and I understand the arguments uh, very much around needing to ensure that certain bodies are involved in tackling child poverty at a local level. Um, I suppose, you know, in terms of uh, a, a compromise, uh, that could be um, 
you know, uh, placing uh, a requirement on local authorities and health boards uh, when preparing their annual reports uh, to consult with those community planning partners that they consider appropriate uh, to determine what measures uh, have been taken by those partners during the year in relation to meeting child poverty targets. And that could be something that is brought forward at stage three. Uh, annual reports could then include a description of the measures taken by those community planning partners. Uh, and this would encourage local authorities and health boards to bring in appropriate partners uh, and would avoid placing uh, unnecessary requirements on bodies who have um, less relevance uh, on the day-to-day -day issues uh, of tackling uh, child poverty. So for convener, for those reasons, uh, I do recommend that members oppose amendments 50, 51, 52 and 54. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Richard Leonard, uh, to wind up, press withdraw. Um, thanks. I wish to press. Uh, the, um, the, uh, I appreciate very much uh, the, the final passage of the Cabinet Secretary's response, which I think is uh, helpful. Uh, and it may be by the time we get to stage three, something uh, robust may be in place. But I'm a bit like Alison Johnson on the previous amendment. As we sit here this morning, uh, I don't see sufficient evidence that the, um, all of the public agencies out there uh, are going to be um, um, brought in to, uh, with full force uh, to meet the aims of this piece of legislation. And I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says about not wishing to tell uh, local bodies. Um, we're telling local government what to do through this legislation. Why shouldn't it be similarly acceptable to tell central government agencies like Scottish Enterprise uh, what they should be, uh, what they should be doing, uh, and I do think that it's um, uh, it, the Scot Scottish Environmental Protection Agency was mentioned. Actually, there's a big environmental justice movement which says that um, if you look at the location of incinerators, landfills, chemical plants, uh, even the future uh, fracking licensed areas, they are all by and large in areas where poorer people live, uh, and so I, I don't actually think that SEPA is exempt uh, from considering. Uh, poverty and child poverty in its um, in its deliber deliberations. If there are bodies like um, uh, um, SNH uh, that have got absolutely no locus on child poverty, and I'm not persuaded that they have no locus whatsoever, uh, then it's possible, I suppose, to look at exemptions uh, for particular bodies. But if there are to be exemptions, I don't think further education colleges, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands Isles Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, for example, should be exempt from playing a much more active part uh, in the compilation of these reports so that they are uh, accountable. And uh, they do uh, currently um, uh, have an existing duty uh, to act with a view to reducing uh, soci socioeconomic uh, inequalities. Uh, these bodies have also got uh, a public sector equality duty placed upon them, for example. So I don't think uh, that it's unreasonable to ask them to make um, a, a more formal contribution which will be achieved uh, by this amendment uh, to the goal that we share of uh, reducing substantially child poverty in Scotland. And for that reason, I wish to press my amendment. Thank you, Mr Leonard. The question is that amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We'll go to vote. Uh, all those in favour of amendment 50, please show. All those against? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, total votes for three, total votes against four, total abstentions two. The amendment is not agreed to. Thank you. Call on amendment 51 in the name of Richard Leonard, already debated with amendment 50. Richard Leonard, move or not move? Uh, move, company. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yep. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you. Total votes for three, total votes against four, total, ab total abstentions two. The amendment is not agreed to. Thank you. And I call amendment two in the name of Adam Tompkins, group with amendments 26, 53 and 55. Adam Tompkins, move amendment two and speak to all amendments in the group. 
Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, uh, this amendment is uh, designed to ensure that local child poverty action reports are prospective as well as retrospective. Um, I'm not quite sure I've said that right. Um, uh, I think that um, Amendment 26, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, seeks to do the same thing. Um, and I think also that it seeks to do the same thing as my amendment in more elegant terms than mine. So if, as I hope she will, the Cabinet Secretary um, moves and presses Amendment 26, I will withdraw um, Amendment 2. But I think it is important that the <coughs> Section 10 requirement on local authorities um, uh, is one that um, requires their reports not merely to uh, state what they have done um, uh, in order to try and tackle child poverty, but what they propose to do and to continue to do in order to um, tackle child poverty. And that is the force of my amendment too. And I think, if I've understood it correctly, also the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 26. Thank you, Mr Tompkins. Cabinet Secretary, uh, to speak to Amendment 26 and other amendments in the group. OK, thank you very much, Convener. Um, the Committee Stage 1 report highlighted a, a range of evidence that placing a, a forward-looking strategic duty on local partners uh, would help partners to plan how they go about reducing child poverty. Uh, this, in the view of several expert witnesses, would strengthen the duty, uh, making it more uh, effective in meeting its aims. Uh, I have been persuaded on this matter, and for that reason I am putting forward a government uh, amendment uh, to the bill to place an additional uh, requirement on local authorities and NHS boards to set out actions that they plan uh, to take uh, going forward. Um, I appreciate Mr Tompkins' um, uh, comments uh, and his uh, support uh, for the, the, the government uh, amendment. I just thought it might be useful that if I still put on record um, you know, some of the concerns around Mr Tompkins' amendment just so that the committee is fully informed uh, of uh, our thinking. Um, my, my thinking was that I wasn't convinced that uh, the forward look as proposed by Mr Tompkins should only focus specifically uh, on the reporting year ahead um, as, as detailed in his amendment. Um, his amendment would pose some practical challenges just because of an inevitable uh, delay in reporting. For example, the report of activity covering the period April 2018, March 2019 would not be published until after that period uh, had ended. So it may, for example, not be published uh, until June 2019 and the forward look should uh, in terms of Mr Tompkins amendment relate to the period uh, 1st of April 2019 to 31st of March 2020 but by the time the report is published in June, uh, two months uh, of the following year would already have passed and it would therefore not make uh, accurate it wouldn't be accurate to describe measures uh, intended to be taken in April and May 2019 so thank you for bearing with me convener on, on, on all of that um, amendment 26, which I am proposing, will strengthen the duty on local reporting, but it does not uh, restrict local partners to reporting on actions only within the next reporting year, uh, and it does not create uh, a reporting gap. So, for those reasons, um, I um, move uh, amendment uh, 26, um, and I appreciate Mr uh, Tompkins' support for, for 26 and intended withdrawal of amendment 2. On amendment uh, 53... Uh, again, I appreciate absolutely why Alison Johnson wishes to include reference to measures relating to income maximisation uh, for pregnant women and families on the, the face of the bill. Uh, but the member has already received a commitment in writing from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport that we will be rolling out the Healthier Wealthier Children programme across Scotland. And as I said earlier, uh, I don't think it's uh, sensible to overload the bill uh, with reference to taking uh, of measures in relation to specific matters that restrict the flexibility uh, of local areas uh, that they have to develop proposals as they see fit. And I think this is a, a key point. Uh, local areas will know best what works for them in terms of supporting uh, their diverse communities. And that's why the reference group uh, that I've set up includes representation from across the country and will certainly be uh, working with them to look at how best to uh, disseminate good practice and share examples of positive projects like Healthier Wealthier Children uh, indeed, uh, we're looking to build on this programme through uh, our uh, programme of financial health checks, which I expect to be announcing for the first delivery plan. Uh, and I can certainly offer to meet uh, with the member to discuss this further. So for, for these reasons, uh, and for these reasons only, uh, I don't support uh, Amendment 53. 
Amendment 55 uh, seeks to require local authorities and health boards to set out measures they are taking in relation to persons who are seeking or have been recognised as having refugee, humanitarian uh, or other internationally protected status. And I very much agree with Ms McNeill that we must consider very uh, carefully the link between poverty and refugees, asylum seekers uh, and others with or seeking uh, other humanitarian uh, protection. I thank her for raising uh, this important issue because it hasn't been raised in the context uh, of, of this bill. Uh, although members will undoubtedly uh, be aware of the very recent inquiry by the Scottish Parliament's Equality and Human Rights Committee, uh, which gave, in my view, a much needed focus to the issues of destitution, uh, asylum and insecure immigration status in Scotland. And the committee made uh, a number uh, of recommendations, the best part of 30 recommendations, uh, which the Scottish Government is now in the process of carefully considering them all. Um, and I'm due to respond to committee uh, in July. Uh, and while my response uh, to um, the committee debate uh, that we had maybe a month or so ago, uh, while I stress that we cannot ignore the cause of the destitution, uh, which is essentially how uh, the asylum system operates, and particularly in connection with things uh, like the, how it interacts with the uh, welfare benefit entitlement. Uh, and there are, you know, you know, issues that are currently reserved to the UK government. So while I'm clear about the challenges posed by reserve matters, uh, nonetheless, I gave a commitment in Parliament uh, and to the committee that the Scottish Government will indeed uh, recognise the opportunities that we have uh, with devolved powers uh, that could make a real difference to, to people's life. And I think we all agree uh, that refugees should feel welcome, safe and able to participate in society. And that's why, uh, as a government, we developed the first New Scots Integration Strategy in 2013, which encouraged uh, innovative approaches and new ways to offer support and to do more to involve refugees. Uh, and as I set out in a speech at the launch of the Scottish Refugee Festival last week, we want to build on that progress and continue the distinctive uh, New Scots approach from day one of arrival. And the delivery plan that I'll be preparing under this bill will be uh, a cross-government plan. Uh, and I will, of course, ensure uh, that the delivery plan is aligned with the principles of other work, such as the New Scots programme. The duty, um, the duty in the bill, as introduced, requires local authorities and health boards uh, to set out any measures uh, taken in their area for the purpose of meeting uh, child poverty targets. And I would therefore expect that where a local authority or health board considers it appropriate, uh, that they would report on the measures that they have taken in relation to families uh, that Pauline McNeill uh, refers to. And of course, uh, Ms McNeill and others will be well aware um, of the great work uh, undertaken by uh, Glasgow City Council in terms of their support for refugees and uh, asylum seekers. Again, I would be very happy to uh, raise this issue with our local reference group and to discuss with them whether uh, this might feature in the guidance that we are developing in collaboration uh, with them. Uh, so, convener, for the reasons set out, uh, I hope uh, Ms McNeill uh, won't press Amendment 55, given that our commitments uh, are now on the record for the purposes uh, of this bill. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Alison Johnson, to speak to Amendment 53 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank, you. thank you, Chair. Uh, this bill is about defining poverty in laws relating to income and setting targets for boosting the incomes of poorer families. And one important way of achieving this is helping people to claim the benefits that they are entitled to. We know that there are a lot of benefits that go unclaimed because the benefit system is it's simply too complex for many people to navigate, so many families don't claim everything they could. We heard from John Dickey of the Child Poverty Action Group in evidence, I think in the Glasgow session, that many families find themselves relying on child benefit, you know, a benefit that is, that is easy to access and, and universally um, available. Well, not entirely now, but... Um, a survey by Turn to Us found that 48% of low-income families aren't claiming the welfare benefits and tax credits that they could be entitled to. And this results in around £15 billion pounds worth of benefits across the UK going unclaimed. So that has a real impact on, on people's ability to, to have any quality of life. 
And the Cabinet Secretary recognises that when families get the advice and support they need to claim, they can gain significant amounts of additional income, which can have a huge impact on reducing poverty. And, uh, you know, the Cabinet Secretary, I I'm delighted that the government are going to roll out healthier, wealthier children because, uh, you know, we know that some families have gained up to £3,000 a year from this project. And that's simply about making people aware of their entitlements and enabling them to claim them. Um, so we do know that across the country some fantastic work is already taking place. You know, we have projects here in, in Lothian that are making a real difference too. Great work's been done by local authorities, by health boards. Um, and I think this amendment, while well, this amendment seeks to facilitate that work being shared, the Cabinet Secretary spoke about disseminating information, sharing that best practice. And for the avoidance of any doubt, I'd just like to, to make clear that this amendment does not require local authorities or health boards to do anything that they're not doing already. It certainly doesn't reduce flexibility. It is absolutely not trying to set their local priorities for them. It's just trying to ensure that we all understand what great work is going on um, and making sure that we can act on that. So all that th this asks is that anything they're doing related to income maximisation, they detail in their local child poverty action report. Um, I think the challenges, th this is an intractable problem. Governments have been trying to solve child poverty, you know, for us, f f for decades um, and, and far longer than that. And we haven't succeeded yet. So I think my amendment simply seeks to help this government or any future government <coughs> get closer to addressing the child poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison Johnson. Paul McNeil to speak to Amendment 55 and any other amendments in the group. Um, thank you very much. I um, can thank the Cabinet Secretary for her comprehensive response to Amendment 55. Um, this was an amendment which was suggested by the Scottish Refugee Council. And it is my feeling that there had been no discussion really in, in Stage 1 about the needs of uh, asylum seekers or anyone as protected under international status um, in the Bill. Um, as already noted, um, it's just a requirement to describe any measures that are taken for the purposes of contributing to meeting the child poverty targets. There is no specific requirement. Uh, I would certainly want to make sure that it's a consideration. It is a complex matter. I appreciate it's a reserved matter. Um, but there are asylum seekers with children living in severe poverty. And I think that I wouldn't like to think that I'm sure there are no local authorities um, or any form of government who would ignore, ignore that fact. But I think if it wasn't mentioned, I think um, I think it would be remiss of, of the committee. Um, I would also um, like the committee to note that it doesn't necessarily mean that there would be uh, that it's a prescription for any financial measures. It could it could relate to services for asylum seekers in, in Glasgow, who the cabinet secretary has already mentioned has done excellent work, um, as many local authorities have, but. Uh, in terms of shelter accommodation for homeless people, there is an asylum, uh, there is, a, there is a, a shelter for asylum seekers, but not for women. And I'm not really certain whether that would include children or not. So there are issues that don't relate to, to finances, but relate to shelter and services um, that need to be um, addressed. Um, on that basis, for, for the time being, I was quite content to, for that to be a probing amendment, to get that on the record. Um, and perhaps there could be some further discussion to just ensure that when looking at plans um, around the country of what um, government and local authorities plan to do to reduce child poverty targets, that this issue is not forgotten about. Um, I would just like to also speak to Amendment 53 in the name of Alison Johnson. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has previously said to, to the committee in relation to some of my amendments on automated benefits, which I wholly welcome, about the importance of that, um, particularly to single parents and other groups. Uh, for me, income maximisation is also a key concept which is related to automated benefits um, because it recognises that there may be a variety of reasons that that people have not applied for all the benefits of which they're entitled to. Alison Johnson's outlined some figures in relation to unclaimed benefits, which is quite uh, worrying. Um, um, I don't know what Al if Alison's going to press an amendment at all, but I'd be happy um, to support her. I'd certainly like to be reassured um, that the Scottish Government are alive to the concept 
of income maximisation. And to be fair, I know we'll probably return to this in relation to the Social Security Bill, and it won't just be a matter that we can discuss in relation to this bill. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you very much, Neil. <clears throat> Adam Tompkins, to wind up. Uh, um, of this <coughs> nothing further to add, um, Convener, other than to say that we'll support, as I've already said, um, Amendment 26 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, and if they're um, pressed or moved, we will support Amendments 53 and 55 as well. So you, you wish to withdraw Amendment 2? I withdraw Amendment Thank 2. You. Is that agreeable? <coughs> amendment 2 be withdrawn? Yeah. Thank you. I call Amendment 52 in the name of Richard Leonard. Already debated with Amendment 50. Richard Leonard, to move or not move? Uh, move, company. Thank you. The uh, question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We'll go to a vote. The amendment's not agreed. Uh, all those in favour of Amendment 52, please show. All those against? Abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, votes for three, votes against four, total abstentions two. The amendment is not agreed to. Thank you. Call amendment 26 in the name of the cabinet secretary already debated with amendment <coughs> Cabinet Secretary to move formally? It moved. Thank you. Questions that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 53 in the name of Alison Johnson. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. Okay. Questions that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a vote. All those in agreement, please show. All those against? Total votes for five, total votes against four, no abstentions. The amendment is agreed to. Thank you. Right. Call amendment 55 in the name of Polly McNeil. Already debated with amendment two. Polly McNeil, move or not move? Not moved. Thank you very much. Call amendment 54 in the name of Richard Leonard. Already debated with amendment 50. Richard Leonard, to move or not move? Uh, move, coming. Thank you. The uh, question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a vote. All of those in favour of Amendment 54, please show. All of those against? Abstentions? Thank you. <coughs> uh, total votes for three, total votes against four. Total abstentions, two. The amendment is not agreed. Thank you. And the uh, question is, that section 10 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call amendment 28 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with amendment 9. The Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Yeah, happy to move the Thank consequential you. amendment. Question is, that amendment 28 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 29 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 9. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. <coughs> Thank you. Question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, question is that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Question is that Section 12 and 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, question is that the long title bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And that in Stage 2 consideration Ooh. of the bill. Uh, can I just thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for coming along and we now move into private session. Thank you very much.